Well, Josh is back. Yes. Right? That's cool. So, uh, yeah, let's let's just get the ball rolling. We'll hit the uh, the audio cue and we'll we'll get rolling here. Are you tired of the same routine of studying the Bible? Well, we thought so too, and it's time for a change. Hi, I'm your host Aaron, and with me is co-host Josh. Hi. So the Bible, you know it, we know it, but how well do we understand it? Hopefully a lot better after today. Hope so. Yeah. So this this was an interesting text, and it's been quite a few weeks yes. since we've actually seen each other in person um, in front of camera here. So um, last we left off, we pulled the mystery of the resurrection in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and, uh, verse 50 through 58. Yeah, yeah, the ending of the chapter. I mean, the whole chapter is about the, the, the resurrection and such, but it's kind of Paul summing up, talking about the resurrection there in, in, in chapter 15. Now, you say summing up, and this is something that's hyper important, uh, and we, we stress this a lot, is context, context, context is always hyper, hyper important when you're studying the Bible because you can read something and think it means one thing, think God means something, but it doesn't apply, or it's not true, or it doesn't work in that context. So... We rewound just a little. Well, we, when you say we, you mean you. I I have trouble taking I, credit. For, I'm sorry. No, no. I started my notes right at 50, but I'll, <laughs> I'll give you all the credit for that. All right. Fa- fine. Fine. Credit credit words do. <laughs> well, first and foremost, in, in my notes, you know, I, I talk about how well-educated Paul is, and he has given his qualifications uh, a couple of different times in argument saying, like, I'm, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was born and raised this way. A well-educated guy. He mm-hmm. knows the text, and he was called specifically by Jesus Christ on that road to witness for him, to teach. And he's he's hyper-focused. He's super serious about it. Mm-hmm. And, and I think one point, just because you brought up that road, yeah. Um, just one thing is, is, since we last met, I, I've taught through the Book of Romans three times already. Uh, and one thing is just this idea of Paul on that road to Damascus, which I know is not in Romans, but he didn't have a conversion experience where he he came to believe something new. It was a completion of what he knew. So that that, that idea of a Hebrew of Hebrews, and he grew up knowing these things. He realized that Jesus was the missing puzzle piece, if you will, yep. uh, to that. So to, we always talk about his conversion on the Damascus Road, but it wasn't a conversion in his mind. It's more of a completion, uh, a completing of the understanding of Judaism, of everything he believed growing up. He didn't change what he believed. It was just brought more complete, that missing puzzle pieces there. Right. So yeah, that's really true. Yeah. And honestly, beautiful. And it's, it's something that when you really think about, when you think about Paul and how harsh he can be sometimes in his writing, he takes this extremely seriously. Very. Um, yeah. And he, he doesn't care about his personal welfare either. No. So... Anyway, enough about Paul. We need to be talking about Jesus here, right? Well, so it's Paul writing, so uh, well, it is. Uh, <laughs> so I, I start my, I started my text research a little bit earlier. I started in thirty five of the same chapter, uh, fifteen. So I'm going to pull up First uh, Corinthians fifty, uh, thirty five and fifteen, fifteen thirty five. Did I say fifty? Yeah, yeah. There's only 16 sorry, fifteen thirty five. Yeah. Apologies. For some reason, of course. We're having tech difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Give me two seconds if you want to. You want me to fill in the gap? Yeah, if you don't mind. That'd All be cool. All right. So, um, yeah, so was pulling, like I said, this whole, this whole chapter, actually, if you want to go back about the resurrection, he goes back all the way back to uh, to verse 1. So it's not, 35 is where you're picking up, I think. But, I mean, all, he's starting it back in verse 1 and how the resurrection is so important uh, to our faith. If, you know, if, if Christ is not crucified, then we should be pitied. Uh, we've believed in vain. Um, just he's, he's building a case of the, the re- how important the resurrection is to our faith. And uh, because it is, it's the ultimate hope that we have, the, of what we have to look forward to. Uh, and Christ is kind of our proof of that, that, that this happened, that it's possible, the power of God. And he's going on explaining the resurrection. So uh, I think you want to pick up there in verse 35. It looks yeah. like you've got it there. So. Now that I've got it. All apologies, right. guys. Especially no for those listening to the audio, they're like, what in the world is going on with these two again? 
Um, so it starts off in verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Um, he continues on. You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies, and that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of, of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men, and another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one, and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For the stars differ from star to star in in glory. Um, Let's see. I think I'm going to continue on to, yeah, I'll go all the way on to 46. So 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. So, rewinding into 35 here, the, the question is, how are the dead raised? How, how do they come to life? And this is for the people that might have denied resurrection at the time mm-hmm. because there were a, a subset of people that were like, no, this, this doesn't happen. Um, so he's, he's asking, or he, he's stating for that question, here's the answer for you know, seeds, essentially. This this is how it works with yeah, seeds. Yeah, basically, you, know. you don't plant the thing that you're, you know, you know, and if you're trying to grow a tree, you don't plant a tree. Yeah. You know, uh, the seed doesn't look like the thing that actually grows. It comes from it, but, but it, it, and it, this, and he makes the point about the seed dying and something no, new coming up. Um, mm-hmm. That's The seed has, there has to be death for life in, in that sense. And you're not planting the exact same thing that you're reaping. Yeah, and it doesn't even look the same. Right. Know, a seed can be small, and we talk as Christians, we talk about like a mustard seed. Um, it doesn't look like what was planted in the ground. It comes out this you know beautiful whatever it's going to be. It could be a flower, it could be a rose, it could be you know a tree or whatever. Um, and then he compares earthly and heavenly glory. That there are bodies for men and beasts, and fish, and birds, they all have specific types of bodies, right, right. earthly and, bodies. And, and like that, he uses, there's different kind of flesh, like for birds, so, mm-hmm. well, they, you know, they live in the air, and they fly in the air. The fish, they live in the water. You, you can't put a fish and it fly. I, I know there's flying fish, but they don't really fly. Um, yeah, birds, glide. for the most part, except for penguins, but their bodies are different. Kiwis. Don't, don't do that well in water. <laughs> right. So, right. you know, in other words, there's different kinds of flesh for, for where, where they live. He's using examples of, of, of different animals and creatures that live in different places. And it showcases to us, like, as he enters into this resurrection body conversation, he's prefacing and give us, giving us a background for why he's about to make the statements that he's going to make. And so we understand what the meaning is. We're going to have a completely different body. It's not going to be the same. It's going to be spiritual. But we get into we get into what that means a little bit later on. You you had some really good notes on that, where it's uh, still around, yeah. still still a body, physical, yeah, it's still a body, and we have evidence of that. Um, he uses if this then that. If there's a natural body, then there's a spiritual body. Um, claims there's no spiritual life before natural conception. And verse uh, 46, he said, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. This could also mean that the natural must die in Christ for the spiritual one to be born in the spirit. Regardless, all humanity has two lives, a finite and an infinite. And we get to decide, we get to decide where our resurrection body spends eternity or where our you know, spiritual continuation mm-hmm. um, lives on. And then that gets us uh, away from my intro into... Into the text that we actually are studying. Yeah. Okay. Into it. So I'll pop that up. All righty. So uh, let's start in verse 50. Go. It uh, says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. 
So we start off with that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Now, first here, Paul is not saying that the material cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We know this because you're arguing, no, no, that's what he's saying. No, the material's bad. And get, that's the teaching of the Gnostics that comes in later. So that's not what Paul's teaching here. We know this because Jesus' resurrection body, remember there's already one, we, ha- we have an example, was a material body and not a spirit, spirit body. In fact, now let's flip over to Luke chapter 24, verse 39. I'll bring it up. Right. So Luke 24. 24, yeah, verse 39. Gotcha. And this is Jesus on, on Resurrection Day appearing to his disciples in, in the upper room, and he says to them, See my hands and my feet, that is, that it is I myself. So he's saying, look, see my hands and my feet. This is me. It's, it's really me. Touch me and see. So that there's something to touch. There's something material there. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. So he's clearly saying, I'm not just a spirit here. Okay. Now, we use the term spiritual body, and, and that can cause some confusion. Um, well, you know, because when we die, we go to heaven as spirits. And some people have this idea that uh, we spend eternity in heaven as spirits. Uh, we've seen the cartoons on the clouds with the harp and all that. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. If anything, heaven's the waiting room. It's not eternal. Uh, heaven comes to earth. You know, Revelation, you look at the end of the book, a new heaven, new earth. Yep. Heaven comes to earth. Earth and heaven now are in the same place. God is God is amongst us and living amongst us. Uh, mm-hmm. Eden's reborn. So heaven, that idea of, of, of where we go when we die now, it, it's kind of a waiting room. And really, Scripture doesn't tell us a whole lot about that except uh, to be absent the bodies to be present with Christ. So Christ had a physical body. So this resurrection body we have is going to be physical, material in a sense. The nature is not going to be physical, but it will be material. You can touch it. It's going to be flesh and bone. Um, he describes his body as having flesh and bone, and, and, and those are material things. And he's claiming he's not a spirit here, but I'm something material. You touch me. You, you can physically touch me. Now, flesh and blood here in this context, that's the bodies that we currently have. Our bodies that are corrupted by sin. Mm-hmm. Uh, the distinction now here might be Paul uses a description of flesh and blood, what we currently have, and then Jesus describes himself as flesh and bone, and that's how he described his body. Now, the difference there I don't really want to get into because there's <laughs> not a whole lot. You can make a whole lot of that, but yeah. you're not using Scripture to make the case. Yeah. Uh, except there are just two different ways to describe it. I didn't realize it, when we first sat down to do like show notes, pre-notes, that kind of thing. I didn't even bother taking the time to look at the uh, translation, like the lemma to see, or the lexicon to see, like, what, what does this mean? Like, what's what's the Greek word that he's using right there? Yeah, there's a distinction there. Yeah. Um, but what it is, whatever you're making, God makes a distinction, and whatever you try to make of that distinction, you're, you're coming up with things that he didn't exactly tell us, except for there's apparently yeah. a distinction. Yeah. And he says, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So these bodies that we now have, the bodies are subject to disease. Uh, eventually, they're going to decay. Well, uh, they start decaying as soon as we're conceived. Well, yeah, yeah. But they're, they're going to rapidly accelerate. Now. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, we're subject to disease, injury. Um, they're not suitable for eternity. Our bodies aren't going to last for, for, for eternity. So we need a new, different body. Yep. So, um, so Tag, you're it. Okay. Um, mine, mine kind of starts at like 50, what I'd call B, uh, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit to the imperishable. Mm -hmm. So like, like Josh, Josh said, the, the kingdom of God is spiritual and incompatible with our earthly bodies. We cannot live in heaven or inhabit heaven without a body change. Right. It does not work. Um, now we, we do see, um, I don't want to go down that road. Let's not go down that road. We'll talk about that after the show. Sorry, guys. Okay. <laughs> now, um, I'm in, now I'm, I'm perplexed. Uh, well, okay. So you know the, the the people that were raptured up um, on on their on their own uh, while they were alive. You mean Elijah and Enoch. There you go. Like, there's only two of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that that immediately comes to mind. Well, they would have had some kind of miraculous body change. I'm assuming. Don't know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and we, we in fifty two in fifty two a we actually go into the like the twinkling of an eye thing and yeah. so you know it could have happened we don't know uh, nobody's for sure um, 
But our bodies have inherent limitations. Like Josh said, they wear out. They start creaking. I, I walk up the stairs now and like my knee creaks on one side. And like, I don't want to take the elevator. Uh, we can't see the spiritual without assistance. So Jacob, when he goes to meet Esau, um, he's actually, he actually has the veil lifted off of his eyes so he can see the spiritual realm. He can see the army of angels of God that's quite literally God saying, listen, I'm, I'm here you're safe. Everything's going to be okay. Of course, Jacob doesn't take it that way. Right. And, and that reminds me of Elisha and his servant. The one time Elisha prays that, that God will reveal to his servant and lift the veil so he can see the armies of heaven. Yeah, so, so literally there's yeah. a limitation that our eyes have that we can't see it. It's something that we can't uh, taste, see, smell, touch. We can we have evidence that it's there. The Holy Spirit, I think, can, can speak to us and, and tell us that this is real. Um, but we can't see it without godly assistance. Um, that's my notes on 50. What about 51? Yeah, so going on to 51, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Um, we, meaning every human, all humans. It doesn't matter if you are a Christian, atheist, agnostic, whatever. Um, we're all going to be subject to this change. It is going to happen regardless. Uh, we're destined for death, but some will not experience death. And then there's a however, uh, our transformation is inevitable. Mm-hmm. So those that will not experience death are the ones that are going to be alive at that point in time uh, when Jesus comes, when the horn sounds, and then snap, change, transformation, new body. Uh, and now we can get into 52. No, no, no I got 51. You got 51? Oh, okay. Go, go. You did your notes on 51. (laughs) No, yeah, it starts off, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, mystery here is mysterion. Uh, This was something that was secret and it required initiation to know. You had to be be known. Something that God needed to reveal for it to be understood. Uh, Something that uh, they were not going to figure out on your own. So Paul's like, Behold, I want to tell you a mystery. This is something God has to reveal to you. You're not going to figure it out yourself. And it's we'll not all sleep, but we will all be changed. So first, sleep is a delicate way of describing death. He is talking about death here. Um, but he's saying not all believers will die. But he's saying all believers will be changed. Um, there will be a generation of believers who are alive when they are transformed into their resurrection bodies. They will not face death because, and that's where we get to verse 52. Yeah. So if you want to pull that up. Um, yeah. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on, oh, no, I'm reading verse 53. Yeah. Was, <laughs> now you're skipping ahead. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> so in a moment, I'm like, this doesn't make sense at all. Um, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Um, so, in a moment, in the twinkling of eye and at the last trumpet, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. So here we see a description of the rapture. Paul also gives this description in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 18. Um, now, um, in the Greek, it's called the harpazo. Uh, means to be caught up. Now, there's a lot who like to argue that the word rapture is not in the Bible. So those of us who believe in the rapture are believing in something that's not biblical. The problem is the word rapture comes from a Latin base, not a Greek base. So you're not going to find a Latin word in a Greek writing. They just they don't use Latin words, they use Greek words. But the word Latin the, that we get rapture from, rapturo, um, will show up in the Vulgate. That's Jerome's translation of the Bible into uh, Latin. So when the Bible's written in Latin, you actually will find the word rapture in there. You won't find it in an English Bible because uh, it comes from Latin, and you won't find it in a Greek Bible because it's not a Greek word. Um, so if those who say the word rapture is not in the Bible, uh, they're looking at the wrong language. It's there. It's just in the Latin Bible. <coughs> So there will come a time, and we can disagree on when this time is, and as believers we often do, 
Uh, when it gets to eschatology, that's where we like to disagree most. It's okay. Uh, but there is a time, even though we might disagree when it is, that all believers will be gathered. They will be caught up with Christ, and we will be changed, those who are dead and those who are still alive. So, um, now this does not mean that the dead are taking a dirt nap. Uh, First Corinthians, I mean, Second Corinthians five eight, which uh, I already alluded to, Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, I believe earlier I said Christ. He actually says Lord, uh, so I might have misquoted him there. Uh, I think he means the same person though. Um, yeah. So, so we're not we're not taking a dirt nap. There are people who teach that you know we die, we're sleeping until the resurrection. That that's not what Paul's yeah, teaching. It's not blank. Uh, and we're not giving the details to what this means exactly, although that has not stopped many from trying to fill them in. Uh, what it means to go to heaven. We don't really have a whole bunch of details right now, but in some way, those that are dead are now present with Jesus, awaiting this moment of change to come. So heaven's the waiting room. It's it's not our eternal destination because we don't have our new bodies there yet. And then he says, at the last trumpet. So what is this trumpet? And your answer will likely depend on your eschatology, your, your uh, understanding of end times. Uh, for those who believe Jesus returns later in the tribulation, uh, they believe that this is the trumpet from Revelation chapter 11. Now, for those who believe Jesus returns before or earlier in the tribulation, uh, they believe it is the trumpet mentioned in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, and is distinct from the trumpets of Revelation 11. The trumpets of Revelation are the trumpets of angels, if you look at that, you know, there are trumpets blown by angels. And the trumpet of 1 Thessalonians 4.16 is called the trumpet of God. 1 Thessalonians 4 is clearly talking about the same event that Paul's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 15. So Revelation is only talking of the same event if you're making it fit your doctrine. So you can kind of figure out where I fall in there. <coughs> so the last trumpet also uh, was a figure of speech. From, Roman milit- from the Roman military. And we know Paul likes to pull some stuff from the Roman military sometimes. So uh, the Romans, every day when a legion marched, they would set up a camp, a fortified camp every every day. Tents lined up in rows, wall built around it, every, I mean, every day. And they would strike that down every day. So the first trumpet meant it was time to strike the tents and prepare to leave. The second trumpet meant it was time to fall in line. The third and last trumpet meant march away. So the last trumpet could describe the marching orders of believers at the time of the rapture. And I think if you look in that context, it fits really nicely with uh, everything else Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, so that's what I got on, on, on verse 52 there. I like that. I, I kind of split 52 in, into an A and a B. I wanted to get into the science of it a little bit. He says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And so I looked, you know, how long does it take? Uh, for light to pass through the eye and travel the, dis- the distance between like the cornea and the retina, aka you know that twinkling of an eye. Right. He's using he's using a basis of time that is actually measurable, uh, and it's it's a really odd number. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of femtoseconds, uh, but it's a hundred thousand femtoseconds, which breaking it down is point uh, zero 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 one seconds. So it's that. Fast. So that if light that's can pass through. And if that's a hundred thousand femtoseconds. How what's a femtosecond then? <laughs> Point zero zero zero. <laughs> you gotta add two more zeros on oh, wait, no, not two more. Hundred thousand. So you'd have to add like five more zeros after that. Oh, wow, that's a lot of zeros. That's a lot of zeros. So it's it's super fast. Yeah. To us, it's an immeasurable without so, getting so down to math. It we just all, happens. We always do like that. And then twinkling yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, it's faster than it's that. It's way faster than that. That's yep. way, that, that's, like, that's like super slow because like that that takes a... Yeah. Like, you know, like a, a tenth of a ten, second. Yeah, yeah, ten, yeah, ten milliseconds or something. And what, what I got out of this in the moment in the twinkling of an eye will be changed. That to me says that Paul is saying, don't wait. This is going to happen fast. And if you're going to witness to people also... 
It behooves you to go as fast as you possibly can. Talk to as many people as you possibly can because no, no, it wait, could be on. too late. When you say go as fast as you can, you don't mean talk as fast no, as you can. You no, mean no, don't no, waste no. your time. Yeah, don't waste okay, your time. I just want to clarify ensure that. that you're not... <laughs> <laughs> ensure that you're not biding your time just waiting for that that perfect I'm moment. waiting for the perfect moment right yeah, yeah, yeah. let don't, the don't holy spirit yeah let the holy spirit be your clock right and don't let somebody fall by the wayside or don't let yourself fall by the wayside without making that decision to follow Jesus Christ because it is an immeasurable to a human without getting down to like paper math uh, moment in time it's that fast um so basically, your point. I want to build off that real quick before you go yeah, on. Go. I just want to uh, elaborate off of that. Go. So basically, you're you're saying like maybe Paul's warning here is uh, there's not going to be a warning. <laughs> it's going to happen so fast right. you won't even. Well, what? what? It, it's done. Um, so don't think like, well, Jesus is going to warn us when he's coming back. So I know I've got plenty of time, but it's going to be something that's so instantaneous. Don't waste the time that God's given you. Pretty much. Okay. And, and it, again, depends on your eschatology. If you, depending on what you believe and, and what order it happens in, we know for a fact the dead will rise and then the transformation will happen for the people that are alive. Right. Um, however, the only thing that we have is kind of a couple of clues as to when we get a little bit closer to that point in time. Right. We don't know yet. And Jesus doesn't know yet. When God says go, that's when he goes. Right. He doesn't know yet. Well, I'd argue he knows now. You think he knows now? Yeah. He's glorified in heaven sitting on the throne. I think when he said the Son of Man doesn't know, that was before he was glorified. You think that was when he was 100%? On the earth, yes. The, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Okay. I, I think there's a good, argu- good argument to be made. How about that? Because we're not in heaven. But I think okay. now that he's on glory sitting at the right hand of the throne... All knowledge has been given. Yeah, yeah. I think I think he has an idea of, of, of the plan now. Okay. Um, I'm thinking as, as he was walking, be, that's before he died. Yeah, all of it in score. So it was before he died when he said, "Even the Son of Man doesn't know." I think he was talking. I think he was telling the truth then. I don't think he knew then, but I think there's there's a case that may, he he may know now. I can get behind that, but I'm going to be writing that down for something that I can study on my own later. Yep. So you guys do the exact same. And honestly, though, it does him not knowing though does fit the picture of a Jewish wedding really well, preparing yeah. the place for. So you might want to look that up. Too. That was what I was kind of getting at, but you didn't. Um, yeah, but it, it, it's. I, I normally uh, he couldn't go for his bride until the father told him. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't necessarily mean he he can't know when. But I do think when he when before at least before his crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus did not know the time. I yeah, we can say that for absolute. Yeah, um, but yeah, we also know that Jesus is in. He's he's preparing the place for us right now yes. as the bride of Christ. So. Yeah, that, he's that's doing it as the groom. He's preparing us, the prince. Us, we're we're the, bride. the bride of Christ. Yeah, yeah, yes. I just want to get that right. Well, that's why I said bride of Christ. Not right, right. Well, there's people that will just take anything you say and twist it. So. This, yeah, this is why he's here. So, <laughs> and then uh, 52B, at the last trumpet, uh-huh. for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. So there, there's an order of how it works. Mm-hmm. Um, and trumpets signify the appearance of God. Um, it's not... The final trumpets uh, from Res- uh, Revelation. Now, at first, when I was going through this study, I was like, huh, that sounds like, you know, the the, the seven the trumpets seven that trumpets, are going to be yeah. sounded. So I, I popped myself into Revelation. I read, and I'm like, oh, that makes a good amount of sense. And then I read a couple of different um, commentaries where they refuted that. Because mm-hmm. you still have the bowls to follow and such, yeah. yeah so it's, it, it to me, in my mind, it's not... It doesn't have anything to do with the seven trumpets of uh, the tribulation. Mm-hmm. It is. It is. But there, there are those that will make that argument, and, mm-hmm. and they can make a decent argument. I don't agree with it, but they, they, there is an argument to be made there. I, I also, and I'm, I'm still learning how to not only defend this, but to also explain it. So I'm still in my infancy phases of, of what I personally understand as end times. Um, I believe that, as of right now, I believe that we won't see these things. The, the church, the bride of Christ, will be taken away first. Right. That's my personal belief, and I'm still learning how to defend that and explain it. Could I give you supporting scripture right now and say this is why I believe it? Absolutely not, but I have, I have read Revelation. I believe I understand it as well as I possibly can now, but there's also uh, the bridegroom... Um, why are yeah. we celebrating? Can't, can't leave out John fourteen. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So that's that's where I am in in my faith. Where that's what I believe, and I, I 
Josh, you apparently are the exact same way. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, there's, there's, argue, and this is where it comes with eschatology. There's, there's decent arguments made on all sides. There's good theologians that, that are, you know, whether it's pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennial, um, whether there's um, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath, you'll find good theologians, good commentaries for all of them. Uh, so it's one of those things that we're just going to have to wait and see as it unfolds and see who's right then, how God's plan is. Yeah, the, t- the timing um, that, ultimately doesn't really, doesn't. it's not that it doesn't matter. It doesn't have a basis on whether or not you are reconciled in Christ. No, we, we all believe these things are going to happen. We just argue which order and exactly yeah. how they're going to happen. And there's decent arguments to be made. And it, it's one of those things I don't think we should divide over. No. Um, I think my study of the Bible and, and th- 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 there's a lot more clues to it, especially like I said, a Jewish wedding pays a big point in uh Thing, yes. uh, and I think in the setup of why I, I'm, I'm pre-trib, pre, pre-millennial, but it could be, you know, I think I think it's a millennial that, that believes everything gets better, everybody, almost everybody gets saved, Jesus comes back. That's the one I hope is true. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't think the scripture supports it, but I'm, I'm, my, I'm, if I was picking, I'd pick that one. Uh, it's not the one I hold to, but it's it's my favorite. Um, and I know I, I, I didn't give it a fair shake there, but you know I, I kind of like that idea that, that all the bad stuff's really happened and the good stuff's ahead, and everybody, almost everybody gets saved. I love that one. Ultimately, this this study is not about end times no, no. prophecy. There might the, come a time we pull something where we're going to do some eschatology, but it's, it's not. Happen. It's not today. Yeah, we, we, we've already done head coverings. We've already done a uh, uh, list of names. You know, uh, we've we've had our fund. Punishment, so, punishment yes, of yes. Israel for disobedience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, right after October, right, we pulled that right before October seventh. Yes. I've got the thousand yard stare because uh, it was October fourth. We pulled that. Yeah, that was great. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, the key is the trumpet will sound, and that trumpet is for the church. Yes, it is for God's well, Jesus's. And if, people, want, and if you want, and if you want, and into, and if you believe it's one of the trumpets in Revelation, you know, the seventh trumpet, we're okay with you thinking that. We, we don't. It's not what we come to. We're not telling you. Uh, we are telling you you're wrong, but we're not telling you you're wrong. Like shame on you. You need. You know, if anything, if someone ever thinks we're wrong and they study the scripture more to prove us wrong, well, we win, or God wins, really. You know, that's yeah. what, you know, God wins because we all we all come out a little bit more knowledgeable on things. Yes, but that is why this type of podcast exists, is so we can go in and we can study, and you guys can study with us, and we can come to each other and have meaningful, kind conversations. And recently, we actually, just to kind of sidestep a little bit, we actually had somebody on Instagram or U- YouTube. It was oh, a, no, one of our country. YouTube shorts. Yeah. And uh, there was a gentleman that was, he got a little heated of, um, what, he's he was atheist, agnostic? What I forget his story exactly, but he was not pleased with anything that we were doing. I know you talked to him a little bit. Oh, oh yeah. I Did thought you talked about the one you, you had to kick somebody off. Yeah, I actually did have to kick some, I didn't talk somebody. To the guy you kicked off. Um, I didn't, that guy that I thought was a believer. Yeah, and, and, and he was despairing somebody else's comments. I think too, not even the video. Yeah, personal attacks are not allowed. Yeah, um, even though we're all sinners and we all recognize that we could all fall to that type of thing, um, this is, in the old sense of the term, a safe place for Christians and even non-Christians to meet up talk, have a discussion, and come out better on the other end. And you cannot come out better on the other end by calling somebody names or being mean. And we don't have to agree. It's it's okay. It's not a prerequisite, you know? Yeah. So I... Now that we've lost everyone not interested in the end times. (laughs) So anyway, (laughs) on to, to, uh, what, uh, 53? I'll I'll take 53. Yes, sir. Uh, For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. So he's saying for this, because of what I just said, what Paul just said, um, that it, that we're going to be changed, there's going to be a trumpet sound, right. because of what is inevitably coming, we must prepare. And that goes back to what I was saying a little bit earlier, is we're, we're not out of time, but if we live our lives as if we are out of time in relation to ensuring that we have salvation, that we are studying the word, that we are witnessing for Christ, that we're doing our absolute best with what we can, then we have a little bit less to worry about. In, in 
my mind. Josh may want to expand on that, or you want me to keep on rolling? Well, 53, uh, Paul has made the case for why this must happen, You know why, why there must be a resurrection. Mm-hmm. And now he restates what is a must in the destiny of the believer. Uh, what is a must is for the mortal to put on immortality. Um, then we get into this verse 54. Uh, before you go to 53, I've got two... Two other small notes. Oh, 53? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I, I, saw the, I, saw the, yeah, no, yeah. I saw the look on your face, and I was like, hmm, maybe he has oh, no, something no, to no, like, no, interject. No, 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 I'm sorry. No, you're I good. had very short notes on 53. <laughs> you had longer notes. Well, for mine, um, we, we need to put on clean garments. We need uh-huh. to become cleansed by Jesus. We need to await our bodily transformation, dead or alive. And like Josh said, you know, when we die, it's not blackness. It's not... It's not some kind of like coma that we go into where we don't recognize anything, like even the passing of time. We still experience. Right. So dead or alive, we're going to have to be prepping and waiting. Mm-hmm. So now I guess we can go to 54. Now we can go to 54. Yeah. You just gave me back for reading 53 early. Yeah, sorry. But. I normally do things out of order, so. Yeah. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality. Then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Right? Did I read the yeah. right one? Yes. Okay, yeah. okay. Oh, no, no. I went too De- far. Death is swallowed up in victory. That's 54, and then a 55 goes into, oh, oh, death, where is your victory? Yeah, yeah, 54 is what I'm supposed to be reading. Okay, yeah. yeah. So death is swallowed up in victory. Our resurrected bodies... They're not going to be like reanimated corpses. Uh, they're part of a new order of life. Let me get this part. They will never die again. Death is defeated by resurrection. Um, let's see what there. I, well, I heard I heard NT Wright talking about this, and, and it's a good way of looking at it. Stop thinking of Jesus as coming back from the dead. Lazarus came back from the dead. Um, the widow's sons from Elijah and Elisha, they came back from the dead. Dorcas came back from the dead. Um, Peter's mother-in-law came back from the dead. Um, I saw that part in The Chosen. Jairus' daughter comes back from the dead. But what happened to them? They died again. They all died. Jesus doesn't come back from death. Jesus comes through death. When Jesus was resurrected, he has a resurrection body now. He's come through death. Death has no power over him. He can't die now. And that's why it's important to recognize him as the last Adam. Yeah. So we, when we're resurrected, we're going to be like Jesus. We're going to come through death. We'll come through death. To never die again. Mm-hmm. We're all dying now. We're all going to die. Okay. I mean, unless Jesus comes back, we're all going to die. With our resurrected bodies, we go through death. Death has no power. It's swallowed up in victory. I can't wait till we get to verse 56. Yeah, yeah. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. So that's what I got. That's what you got. Yeah. And that was that was 54. Yeah. Um, the prerequisite of coming out on the other side as a winner, essentially, is acceptance of Jesus. Yeah. Um, you can come out on the other side. You can be transformed, and you could be condemned. Like there's, there's really two options, and those two options are the ones that God gives us because he is God, and he has the right to do it. Um, and it's prophesied in Isaiah 25, 8, um, about, uh, death being swallowed up in victory. Uh, Isaiah 25, 8 says he will swallow up death for all time and the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. Now you, you could say he will wipe tears away from all faces and say, oh, well, it's, it's, it's everybody, everybody's saved, but he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, his people. Mm -hmm. And who are his people? Those Those who believe. Yeah. Those that believe. Uh, That's my notes on 54 is, is pretty clean, pretty easy. Yes. Um, Some of these get easier. Some get more, some, some verses are easier. (laughs) Some are more complicated. Well, and both our style on, on this breakdown (coughs) was to go verse by verse where sometimes it, it doesn't work out well to go verse by verse. This one was, but someone did email you two weeks ago. Hey, I think we should go verse by verse. If you just read the email. Uh, okay, so, all right. So he, send, he sends me his notes like two weeks ago or whatever while he's in Kenya teaching Romans, and he's sitting there tippy-tapping on 1 Corinthians 15. Uh-huh. And I'm like, dude, calm down. 
And uh, well, I thought we were going to try to do it live from Kenya. Yeah, we ended up not doing that. Well, um, in, in seeing the audio problems we had, it was probably. Oh, good I'm we so glad we didn't do that. Yeah. I apologize again, guys. That duplicate audio thing is going to haunt me forever, but I won't do it again. We'll get it fixed. Anyway, 55. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? And this is a continuation of 54, obviously, where it says death is swallowed up in victory. Continues, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Uh, we have victory in Jesus. Death lost I when he arose. Song. Oh, I'm sorry. I you... Sweet victory in Jesus. Victory in My Jesus. My Savior forever. Yeah, yeah. 425 in the Baptist. He, he sought me and bought me. What? Mm-hmm. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we sang it enough, I knew. Blessed assurance was 334. Victory in Jesus was 425. How do you do that? Well, I went to a Baptist church and we sang one of those two every week. Well, I went to Church of Christ and every single but you time didn't we have a Baptist hymnal, did you? We had a we had a and, and Jesus loves me was 336 just to round it out. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the sting of death will be gone forever yeah. after our transformation. Like yeah. Josh said, once we have our transformed bodies, it does not matter whether or not you're saved. There is no death except separation eternal separation from god right so that would i guess be considered a final death but we're not gonna have it right so i I guess i kind of contradicted myself there didn't i um we'll be united with god through jesus how'd you contradict yourself well i I missed it i said that um there is no death after the transformation but the final death is considered um, same, same with separation from well, okay, God but, and but eternal here, damnation, correct? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll make it easier for you. Um, we're talking about believers here. Yeah, we're talking about believers. So there is no, there is no other death. Yeah, so you don't contradict This yourself. is it, yeah. Because yeah, when, when Paul death. says we, I think, he, I think he's, he's talking to believers here. He's yep. not really getting into damnation, uh, separation from God, um, in the whole eternity in hell, because that's a whole other argument. Yeah, to have. and this is not that. This is yeah, the rather. I, I this think, is the. This is the. I think he's, reconciled. He, I think he, he's talking to believers, and he's talking yeah. about the hope of resurrection to believers. So I think he's really focusing on. So you could you could say there's no death after that because to believers there is no death. Okay. Yeah. As long as we stay on topic, but my yeah. brain normally yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. work that way. I'm rewiring it yeah. for that because you're, you're trying to use logic. But I think here we just follow yeah. Paul's argument. He's he's. Speaking to believers is his audience. Well, in going back, he's already qualified the fact that some of us will not actually have death. We, right. we won't actually um, experience death, not right. have. Um, physical death. Yeah, yeah, physical death. Right. Um, so in Hosea thirteen fourteen, which is um, like a supporting uh, verse that, that I pulled up from my actual Bible, uh, shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? O oh, death, where are your thorns? O oh, Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion will be hidden from my sight. So this is what uh, Paul is saying. Then will come about in, in 54, then will come about the saying that is written. And that, that's what he's referencing out. Right. Um, is this in Hosea 13, 14. Right. And a lot of times when Paul quotes the Old Testament, he doesn't quote it verbatim like our Bibles have it. No, it sometimes gets really confusing. Yes. I'm like, where is it again? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He, he kind of gets the idea. He's quoting the idea sometimes. And it almost seems to me like he is uh, he's quoting it from memory when he writes it down. Like he doesn't have the text in front of him. And well, a lot of times like... Well, sometimes he's quoting from a Septuagint, yeah. which is a translation. And then we go back and we're reading from a different translation of that, you know, so, uh, you know, he's he's quoting into a, a translation into Greek and then quoting Greek. And then we're going back to the original Hebrew. And, you know, every time you, it's like the game of telephone. And you know, every time you translate or whatever, languages are not exactly overlapping in the same uh, grammar and stuff and, and stru- sentence structure and all that change. That actually brings up, um, there was a lady on our Facebook page that mentioned that the King James Version is the only, the true version of the Bible. The problem with that thought process, and, and I mean this respectfully, and I brought this up, is there are new manuscripts, there are new texts that are being found all the time. Even the Dead Sea wow. Scrolls, regardless of if we consider them extra biblical, um, are extremely important for being able to pick up sentence structure and how things were written so we then better understand the text that we have you know, prior right. to well, that. And, and, and that helps constantly us learning. Well, and like the Dead Sea Scrolls show us how accurate the texts we have are. Um, you, you know, because because we find things that are older, oh, well, it, it still was the same. Yeah, yeah. The problem with KJV only is they believe that that is what was ordained by God, written by inspiration. So, 
it's more even than the Greek, but that means God only likes people who speak English. So I, I don't know. You yeah, just, it's it's a, it's a difficult yeah, slippery slope to yeah, slide down. Yeah. If that is your preferred version, totally fine. No, it's it's nice and poetic, and the older I get, the easier it is to understand. Yeah. Um, and look, look my nine year old, she was in here earlier quoting verses from the KJV. Oh, from uh, Hebrews. Yeah, from yeah. Hebrews eleven. Yeah. So uh, just just the thing she wants us to pull Hebrews eleven today. So uh, she wants so bad to be on the show. Yeah, yeah. We need, we, we need to day. do have, we need to have a kid friendly. Uh, well, I guess it is kid friendly. But we need to have a a kid uh, study. We of, could do a uh, we could do a special episode sometime maybe. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. All right, so we're in verse. Are you done with verse fifty five? I am done. There All really right. wasn't a lot. No, there's not. I, I got fifty five. Fifty five. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Uh, because of the work of Jesus, death is a defeated enemy. For believers in Jesus Christ, death no longer has power over us. Yes, believers in Jesus will die, except for those that you talked about who are alive when Jesus returns yes. and gathers up his believers. But death is not final for us. We will live again, but we will not die again. So then let's get to verse 56. That's the one you're really looking forward to. And I think you've got a lot of notes on that. So. I, I do. And I'd, I'd like to I'd like to feed off that a little bit, what you said. Uh-huh. That's something that, that Christians, we tend to get made fun of. Yeah. Of our hope that there is something beyond in the afterlife or that there is an afterlife. Right. Where a lot of critics of Christianity, especially the the vocal minority of very angry critics of Christians, are like, "Oh, well, that's just a coping mechanism because you you can't stand the idea of there not being something out there." Um, I don't even think of it that way. Right. I think of just how beautiful it is. Right. Like it's it's not even a question in my mind that there is an afterlife. It's just the beauty of it. It's already a firm foundation. Right. So if you're building that foundation, this is a great passage of what's going to be happening. Um, the mystery of resurrection. There is a resurrection. Here's the answers for it. Right. Um, anyway, uh, 56, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. You've already covered your... No. Portion of 56? No, no, I didn't even read it, so you read it for me. Oh, sorry, go. That's that's it right there. The sting of de- death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. So the resurrection shows that we're not under the law anymore, uh, but rather we're under grace. Amen. Sin is the ultimate cause of death. And actually, I know we we're, we're going to go to Romans here, but actually that's that's in Romans 5. <laughs> um, and, and we're talking about 7 and 6 a little bit. Yeah. So the result cannot be defeated until the cause is defeated. So sin uses the law to produce death in us. And my Romans, uh, my notes just say, see Romans 7, and you actually have Romans 7. So I'm going to let do, you yeah. unpack a little better, because I, I just said, you know, see Romans 7, because <laughs> I was in the middle of teaching Romans every day. Uh, and But we are free from the sin and law, and we died to both of those through Jesus. Uh, uh, sin, we can see we died to sin in Romans 6, Paul makes that case. But then in the beginning of Romans 7, he makes the case that we also died to the law. You know, the law only has power over us until we die. And then when we died with Jesus, and he's using that, that figurative spiritual, uh, through he uses baptism as an example in chapter 6. With Jesus on the cross, we died to sin, and we died to the law as a way of pleasing God. So go ahead, take yeah. it away, because you're going you're gonna to unpack Romans 7 a little bit for us. So yeah, here. you're going to get a little bit better detail there than I did. Off we go. So in Romans 7, 7 through 13, I think, yeah, is what I have. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good, Therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. 
Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. So when I first read um, The Sting of Death is Sin and the Power of Sin is the Law, I, I hooked, during this study, I hooked myself on, and the power of sin is the law. I'm like, what is he saying? Is he saying that the law is the reason we have sin? Is, is the law at fault for that? No. And then I go, I go into deeper study, and I stumble into Romans 7, where he literally answers that question. Um, so yeah, at first glance, to me, it, it looked like law was at fault for sin. Right. Um, and I love how he ends that, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. Yeah, rather than being reliant upon or, something but, else But when wrong. Paul wanted to describe sin as being something bad, horrible, and wicked, and evil, and all that. Sin is sin. The w- word he came up with was sin. <laughs> I mean, it's an <laughs> adverb. It became, sin became sin. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, utterly sinful. <laughs> I mean, there's just no wor- worse word to describe than sin. That speaks volumes on how Paul thinks, too, uh, about it. So that's cool. Um, So sin brought about death, starting with Adam and Eve, breaking a rule, uh, a a rule, a law, an an ordinance, a statement that God made. You can eat from any tree in this garden except for the one that has knowledge of good and evil. That means that they were able to partake in the one that gives eternal life. So they just had to not do it. And what did they do? They did it. Well, that's when sin entered into us. That's when we became, uh, I guess we were always capable of sin. Well, when you but say it had no entered, power over us. You said sin entered into us. What do you mean by that? <sighs> Is this a trick question? I don't know. I don't know what you mean by it. Okay. <laughs> so, I know what others mean by it when they say it. I'm not sure what you mean by right. it when you say it. All right, throw down here. So when they were told not to do something, right. and I'm, I'm seeing this from a father's standpoint because I have children, those children will go and they'll do it anyway. In some cases, they'll do it just because they were told not to or because now it's tempting. Um, and at that point in time, they become wrong because they disobeyed. So sin entering us or entering them um, was was opening themselves up to that temptation and then acting on it. So you said sin came to us. What do you mean by sin came to us? Well, we wouldn't have sin unless there was some kind of okay, a temptation. So, so a sin, came, sin comes into the world. Well, the tempter was already here. Oh, the, he yes, predate, the tempter was he already predate, here. He yes. predates their sin. Um, he, he came to life during creation. Mm, unless you believe in pre He might have been pre creation. Well, the sons of God were were singing God's praises at the foundations of, of the world. So they might have been predating our creation. Now, they came to be, I mean, the creation of our universe. They well, obviously... We um, start within the beginning, God. Mm-hmm. And from there, creation happens. Well, that says he created the heavens and the earth. They're not necessarily bound by the heavens and the earth, are they? We don't know. See, we're adding into what we don't know. Oh, my goodness. But Job yeah, now, t- we're, but, now we're going into yeah, no, different no. But Job realms. tells us the sons of God were, were singing at the foundation of the world, which kind of reminds you of, uh, if you ever read the Silmarillion by J.R.R. Tolkien. But anyway, that, that's yeah. not the point I was making. So you're saying sin come, th- their their actions cause sin to come in the world. We live in a fallen state, a, a, a world that's sinful around us that causes us to eventually sin because of, of its influences. That's what I mean. Okay. Okay. Others, no, 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 no. See, that, I'm fine with that. Yeah. No, others teach a, a, what's called original guilt that uh, we sinned in Adam. No, no, yes. no, 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 no. Well, no. from Augustine on, it's been taught. I don't subscribe to that. Yeah. Well, it comes from it comes from mistranslation by Jerome, that guy who wrote Latin. Uh, he put in Adam in, in, in um, Romans 5.12. You think he might have gotten the word rapture wrong? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Because it comes from Harpazzo. So okay. I, I always go back to the Greek on that one for Harpazzo. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. But the same guy who brought in Rapture, he brought in the in Adam part. So, okay, I just want to make sure you weren't going there. No, no, no. I'm not going there because I'm not an original sin kind of guy. Gotcha. Um, well, original guilt. Original guilt, yeah, whatever. Yes. Yeah. That you can tell I don't subscribe to it because I don't even know anything about it. <laughs> I just want to make sure what you're saying is understood. That's all. Yes. Because other there's people who will believe that. And again, if you do and you, and you find scripture back it up, it's okay. Yeah. So. Um, all right, uh, let's see. 
Uh, a couple more notes on that. Uh, Paul is speaking from a born again Christian mentality here. He's recognizing the goodness of the law, uh, bringing about the knowledge of sin. Right. Uh, it's explained the, the really law, well in Romans seven. Yeah, yeah. The law is kind of like uh, it shows us God's standard. We don't live up to it. You know, it's kind of like a speed limit sign. We're doing seventy five. Oops, it says forty five. Yeah, it's like how can you? Uh, well, then, no. Go ahead. All you. No, we're oh, on 57. Still, still yeah. into, starting at 57. Yeah, yeah, 57's you. Um, but he says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, blessing and praising God in return for him sending his son is what we all should be doing. Yep. Uh, Paul also recognizes that without the Lord, there would be no victory for us. That was God's plan. That's how he allows us to be reconciled with him. That is our gateway. So, and I was actually having a conversation about this with Katie the other day. Uh, one of the kids had mentioned um, the, uh, the the doorway or the gateway or uh, the entry into heaven is is narrow or the doorway is narrow. And I'm yeah. like, that that's because there is only one way. Right. It is Jesus Christ. It, it's not the fact that it is like super, super hard to go through that doorway. It's the fact that there's only one option out of all of the options that we would want to have. Right. All the rest are wrong. Yeah. There's one right one, the rest are wrong. That's that's and that's okay. how I explained I can, it to the kids. Yeah, I can find that. Yeah. Um let's see. Meaning sin would continue to have dominion over us. So without reconciliation through Jesus Christ, we are subject to our sin. Like you said this morning in in class, sin is fun. And can be, yeah. Yeah. Can be. I should have changed oh, that sin can be fun. Well that that's why I question. I'm like, but what about yeah, I know that was the point you made. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, like, I didn't yeah, do a good job at it, but well, it wasn't written in my notes. So you see, when things pop in your head, sometimes you don't you don't think it all the way out. You just you know you say. Well, so. how many times during this podcast have I said something like I'm not calling you stupid? I'm saying right. how many times have I said something stupid? I, there's probably a, a gaff table. Well, yeah, out there. but sin can be fun. Oftentimes, yeah. sin is fun, and we kind of ignore that. Yeah, we go and, after the uh, pleasure of sin. Right, right. And then, too, when we tell our kids, well, sin's no fun. No, it's a lot of fun. No, it's the consequences of sin that are no fun. Yes. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, in my notes uh, here, pre-notes, um, I'm, go on to 58. No, no, I'll, I'll finish with 57. Victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the victory only belongs to those who belong to our Lord Jesus Christ. Kind of build off your point about the one way. Sweet victory. For Jesus. everyone else. For everyone else. There will be a resurrection, but unto damnation. For those who decide not to trust in Jesus, death is their enemy. That's not where I want to be, dude. Yeah. All right, so why don't you bring our last verse to us? Uh, 58, this ends it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Now, Paul's not saying here that you can work for your salvation. He's saying the work of the Lord will reward you. You are reconciled when you believe and put your faith in Jesus Christ. This is something completely different. This is what you can do in addition to for your rewards. He goes uh, into that, what, I believe in Ephesians maybe, where he goes into crowns, uh, latter part of Ephesians. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he goes into the various crowns like he's wanting to win the race. Um, so he's saying, therefore, my beloved, uh, beloved brethren... He's saying, because of all the reasons I've given prior, because we are all beloved of one another, be these things. Steadfast, stay firm in your faith in God and the Son. Immovable, don't fall victim to false teaching. Study and teach the gospel that was taught to them by Paul, because he personally taught them for like a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, recognizing that this work is the work of the Lord himself, knowing that your toil, which is kapos in uh, Greek, uh, which is labor or trouble, is not in vain, which is kenos. Or, uh, I'm probably butchering that, I apologize, which means empty or empty-handed. Um, in contrast, those who do not toil for the Lord will be empty in the end. Um, the takeaway is to understand that the Lord's work will not leave you empty-handed in the resurrection. So you have your resurrection, right. but I want, I want my arms full of the rewards that are going to be heaped on me for how hard I've worked down here. Right. And it's, it's not a shameful thing at all to want that. So that's me. That's what I got. All right. So I think first 58 gives us our, our application of the passage here. Uh, since we know that death is defeated and we know that we have an eternal and resurrected future with Christ, 
then we should be steadfast and immovable for him right now. We should be abounding in the work of the Lord, working hard for him now, because right now counts forever. I think that goes back to kind of your point about, you know, Jesus is coming back at any moment now. Get to work, you know. Yeah. Um, so even if our work for the Lord uh, were to be in vain according to everyone else, and everyone were to not appreciate or they would discount what we do for the Lord. Our toil is not in vain for the Lord. Whether we get praise or encouragement, it just doesn't matter. Sometimes we may, and sometimes we won't. But here we see resurrection means that our toil is not in vain for the Lord. This should make us steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. We need to not waver, to change direction, to fall, or to quit. The Lord will show his remembrance for our toil of love at the resurrection. Amen. Um, kind of building off that, you mentioned you know, the, the thanks or the recognition that we might get down here. Does it feel good when somebody congratulates you for doing something for God, for good? Yeah, of course it feels really good. Um and it should feel good. Like you should, you should feel happiness when you're furthering the work of of Jesus. Um, but at the end of the day, it's for the Lord. It's work in the Lord. It's the Lord's work. It's not. Right. It's not anything that you should be getting or worried about being credited for because right. that credit will happen in its due time yes. after the resurrection, and it will be a cause for celebration right something that i'm i'm so so looking forward to it's so cool uh, my application is very similar to yours uh, paul's ending instructions before finishing with acknowledgments and goodbyes is the same things that we should be doing to everyone that we meet and i do mean everyone that we meet where we feel convicted where god's opening that door um, in situations where you're talking to someone and they seem they seem sad or downtrodden, if you have any type of link with that person, um, even just in small conversation, just letting them know that you're there for them is a great doorway into then telling them who else is there for them. And there's there's been quite a few conversations that I've had with my clients and my friends where... Um, you lead with the fact that you care and then you finish and continue that conversation or continue and, and then finish the conversation with God cares, right? Jesus cares. Mm -hmm. This is important. And if you're missing that opportunity, but you're telling them how much you care, then you're only doing half of the Lord's work. Right. And that's what I don't want to be doing because that twinkling of an eye, that finger snap, that transformation will happen. And it could happen before you even get a chance to help that person make that decision um, or yeah. So he's talking about the resurrection and the differences between the infinite and the finite, the perishable and the imperishable, but steeped in this entire text is the gospel written down. It's kind of written in between the lines, but the, the, the lesson is still there. The good news is still there that in Jesus Christ, we have resurrection because the, resurrection body in and of itself, the one that we want, the one that we want to have for eternal life, um, where we want to be um, in, in, in our resurrection body, it's rooted in whether or not we believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and our reconciliation with God. So we need to move quickly, spread the word, stay true to the Lord, because death for a Christian is only the beginning a tiny seed that is guaranteed through Christ to transform into a beautiful tree. Um, what was the, it? I, the I, tree planted in the courts of the king or whatever. Remember that's that was, a, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. in Revelation. <laughs> that's also... Uh, I don't know. Was it, um, I, was it one of our passages? Oh, yeah, it was. It was. Which one? It was recent, was it? Yeah. A, no, I just remember that. Yeah, when you said that. Now like, you said that. It, when it you said there. tree, that just popped up. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, the divine arborist basically is what God is. We want to be we want to be planted Psalm, in well, his I think garden. It was Psalm ninety two. It, it was Psalm ninety two. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's the latter part of Psalm ninety two. My goodness, how did I forget that already? Yeah, I literally <laughs> taught that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, 
Um, yeah, we thought that we would go under time yeah. on this one. I said maybe. <laughs> well, you did say maybe. I, I was like, well, we say that, and then we never. Yeah. Rarely. I don't want to speak in absolutes, because only Siths speak in absolutes. <laughs> that was yesterday. That's true. I guess. May the anyway, fifth be with you. Yeah. So now I guess we do the random part. We do the thing. Uh, I read last time, so. Did you? I don't remember. I really don't remember. It doesn't matter. I, yeah, I was the one that read. You pulled, so I pull. You read, right? Uh, yep. All right. You're trying to trip me up. You're putting it on its back. Yeah, All right. Whatever. We're going to go here. All right. We got That's Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Let's look at Jeremiah 49. Jeremiah 49. Because I see a whole section here, so we're going to do it. Because. Uh, otherwise, we're starting one here, or we this just keeps going. Forty nine. You're starting, starting in verse thirty four. Thirty four. Thirty four. Yeah, yeah. Prophecy against Elam. Scrolling, so we scrolling, can get the scrolling. whole prophecy in. I think. Okay, got it. All right. That which came as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elam, at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, "Thus says the Lord of hosts." Behold, I'm going to break the bow of Elam, the finest of their might. I will bring upon Elam the four winds and the four ends of the earth and will scatter them to all these winds, and there will be no nation to which the outcasts of Elam will not go. So I will shatter Elam before their enemies and before those who seek their lives, and I will bring calamity upon them, even, even my fierce anger, declares the Lord, and I will send out the sword after them until I have consumed them then I'll set my throne in Elam and will destroy out of it its ki- out of it king and princes, declares the Lord. But it will come about in the last days that I'll restore the fortunes of Elam, declares the Lord. I'm just going to tell you right now, I have absolutely nothing to say about this text. <laughs> that it's going to require some uh, study. And God is mad and seems righteously so. <laughs> All right. Um, what you looking up? Elam. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know where Elam is. Before. Apparently it's in uh, Iran. Oh, uh, fun. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to have some fun with this one. Uh, prophecy. We, we, we see the, our very first one was Hosea, right? Uh-huh. And it uh, seemed a lot like this one because it was against Judah. Um, well, especially prophecy that ends in some kind of punishment or because not all prophecy was punishment. Um, this is against Elam. So they've done something wrong. They've done something evil. And this is God saying, oh, by the way, I'm going to take you down a peg or two, but I'll bring you back later. Yeah, and, and, and I mean, just one thing that pops out with me, Elam apparently being a country from the southern part of Iran and even southwestern parts of Iraq, or southeastern parts of Iraq, I think, Um do a little more research on this because I'm like, Elam, of all the, I'm just, I'm drawing a blank on <laughs> the kingdom of Elam. Um, okay, so they're definitely a, a, a pagan land and all that, right? But Definitely a warrior nation of some but, sort. But in verse 39, it will come about in the last days, I will restore the fortunes of Elam. Uh-huh. So it's it's not, again, it's, it's a judgment it's not that's not final or whatever. So yeah. God has a plan for them. I don't know. This is going to be an interesting one to study. Well, yeah, it is. It is interesting. He talks. Um, he says, "I will bring." In verse thirty-six, I will bring upon Elam the four winds from the four ends of heaven, uh, which generally, when when you're mentioning the four winds, it's to it's to scatter, mm-hmm. um, and literally follows up and says, "And I will scatter them to all these winds, and there will be no nation to which the outcast of Elam will not go." It reminds me of our study in Ruth where um, Elimelech is like, yeah, let's go to Moab. That sounds like a fun place to go. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't far. That's why he went there. Well, that's true. It was yeah. a, it was a, it was a poo-poo it's a, journey, though. Well, it's the next country over. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. You know, I mean, well, and, and they weren't and they subject had to a famine. Yeah, right? they had food. That was important. So I will shatter Elam before their enemies and before those who seek their lives, and I will bring calamity upon them. Even my fierce anger declares the Lord. And I will send out the sword after them until I have consumed them. I don't want to be on the receiving end of that. No, not at all. What's interesting, though, he says that I will set up my throne in Elam. So it has to be um, either uh, apostate 
like they they've abandoned God. But is Elon was Elon a, a Jewish nation? Was was it Don't Israel so. Hebrew? Yeah, but that's not the promised land. That that's coming back. That's not even. That would be to the east of where even Abraham was from. And he says, "I'm going to set up my throne in Elam. God's throne. God will set up God's throne in Elam and destroy out of it kings and princes." Declares the Lord. So he's going to be getting rid of entire lines of kings to prevent them from going back to whatever it was that they were doing prior. But it will come about in the last days that I will restore the fortunes of Elam. He doesn't say that he's going to restore the the kingship. No. Um, or the well, prior the last kingship. Days, in the last days, Jesus will be the king. So, Well, but that's what I want to know. Like, yeah. come about in the last days, generally that does mean end times. But could last days mean that... Well, the last days it refers to basically the resurrection on the ascension on. And here's a nice... I mean, I'm, 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 take, I'm taking thunder from the lessons, but yeah, Elamites were present in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when God poured out his Holy Spirit upon those willing to repent of their sins, Acts 2.9. So they continued on. That line continued on, which means that they didn't... Well, he says they went to every country. Oh. So... And they, they still continued recognizing themselves as Elamites? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and that Parthians and Medes, that would be from Persia. Yeah. So he lumps them in with the Persians right here. Elamites and it is. Okay. This will be fun. Apparently Isaiah eleven eleven talks about the millennial reign, Jesus c- collecting them and stuff. So wow. uh, apparently he was a children. Uh, he was a son of Shem. Elam was a son of Shem. Oh. Okay. Yeah, this will be good. Yeah. So, um, guys, this is uh, Jeremiah uh, forty nine verse uh, verses thirty four through thirty nine, which is the prophecy against Elam. Uh, we'll follow up in a couple of weeks with a lesson on that. In between now and then, be be studying, be reading, be learning with us. Um, comment, like, subscribe, smash the smash the uh, bell button so you get the notifications when we go live. And smash that like button. Smash the like button and we know the, they're not click watching the, right now. So yeah, watch it happen. <laughs> they will. They'll be like, yeah, we're we're tired of. Making the kids not scream in the background. Well, they had to go to church. Oh, that's true. They yeah, are. Yeah. Yeah. We need to get there. Um, all right, guys. We're going to sign off quickly on that. Any closing notes that you have? No, I think that's it. All I good? Mean, it's just, yeah. Study study about Elam. We, we all got a lot to learn. Yeah, we do. And out goes the bumper. Mm-hmm.